Uh, hello and welcome. I'm your host, Terry Mir, and uh, all of us here at Sustainable Kashi are proud to provide these free classes every week uh, to help us connect to each other and our ecosystem. Uh, feel free to learn more about our project here at sustainablekashi.com. Today, we're talking about our food forests and the lessons we can learn from them. Uh, today, Rob Cruz is, has joined us all the way from the island of Kauai. Uh, he is a steward of the Kauai Food Forest, a permaculture demonstration site, and a living seed bank for the island. Uh, he's growing relationships with the plants and the animals. Rob is just a beautiful human being. He's been here at the Sustainable Kashi and taught me just in his brief stay, he walked to the property. Uh, he and his wife, Andy, spend their days tending to the gardens, playing, and having quite a wonderful online presence as well. So it's wonderful and thank you and welcome for joining us today, Rob. Yeah, thank you for having me, brother. And uh, thank you for hosting this platform and putting putting your energy into this. Um, you know, this is the work that the earth and the people need right now. So happy to see you stepping up to the plate and, uh, and put it on the plate for everybody to come and get if they're hungry enough to get it. Um, um, our project is a very special project. It is, it is, um, it's coming out of a nonprofit, which is called Regenerations, and which is held down by <clears throat> my good friend, Paul Massey, and I would consider him, um, you know, one of my mentors and basically like an embodied, a embodied angel. He's just a, an amazing man. Um, the project came out of him doing seed exchanges for the community. And he did seed exchanges for about nine years. <clears throat> and in that time, he collected a lot of biodiversity and, and created a lot of relationships in the community. Um, and then there was a permaculture design course in 2011. And that in that design course, they created the food forest design. And then in 2012, it was implemented um, with the help of hundreds of people in the community. And uh, the project is a two acre site and it was all created at one time. Um, and the initial layout, it was all done in berms and swales. And the whole thing was covered in cardboard. Um, the whole thing was planted in support species, about a 10 to one ratio in the beginning. And it went through numerous successions that were really interesting to watch. And I was lucky enough to be able to be a part of the project from the initial installation and to see the successions actually happen. And since they were coming out of a design course, they were coming out of a lot of smart farmers and gardeners um, experience at that point already. Um, so it went through um, successions of like all sweet potato and Ethiopian kale. And it was just a solid field of that. And then it turned into one big hedge of pigeon pea and cassava. You know, and then we hacked our way through that, and then it turned into a forest of Suspania sesbind. And then eventually we realized that we made a forest of Suspania and that we needed to get our trees back to the sunlight, you know. So um, then we started getting a little bit crazy with the chainsaws and pulling that down and letting the trees get their light again. Um, but as we were doing that, I feel we were really focusing in on the trees and we really weren't focusing in on making it a complete system. And I think really that's where the, the, the first um, learning curve for me that I wanna share with you guys starts. Um, since this was a kind of a unique project and we bit off the whole thing at one time, we created a two acre project from the get go. And if I would give this suggestion to people that are starting from the beginning, only create as big of a project that you can actually manage as well as you can manage it. So before you plant every single tree in your nursery, because that's how many trees you have, create a tiny little uh, embryo, create an island ecosystem and create that ecosystem as complete as you can possibly complete it. Give it everything it needs before you push out and create anything else. And every time that you do create, you're pushing off the edges of that ecosystem and you're going towards the sun. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? 
because um because what we're learning now and if we would have known this in the beginning we would have saved ourselves hundreds of thousands of hours of work i feel at this point but it's all about the edges like you were talking about the running grasses are hard right because they're always penetrating into your system so if you're working from a system that you have control of the light and you're working towards the light and you have the ground covered in as many layers as you can manage then it gives the soil um, it makes it happy. It, it's putting it to bed. It's content. And when it's content, the, the weeds cannot penetrate into that. Um, so I think one of the biggest things that I, I think it's like the most important is the ground game, is the ground covers. You should go for redundancy in the ground game. Um, not only like what we did in the beginning was the only ground game we did was sweet potato. And it looked amazing. Uh, I did a video a long time ago. I think it was 2014. And at that time, you could see the, the forest was mostly Cispania sesbin and sweet potato. Um, shortly after that, the pigs found our, our, our garden. And the pigs love sweet potato. And they love cassava. So you got to go with the redundancy. If we would have had three kinds of ground covers and one of them would have got knocked out we would have been fine but since we only had one once they found that and once that was completely knocked out of the game our we got left with our pants down and we were just struggling to keep all the weeds at bay at that point and when, since we made the project two acres then it went from two acres of complete forest to two acres of open soil within a matter of months so Ground game, ground game, ground game. Research your ground game. Always work off of your edges. Fill in all the niches so there's no niches left to be created, to be filled in by the weeds. I think that's like the start of what you're really got to do. And when you're making your embryo, um, your embryo food forest, you also got to think of it as a, this is like your palette, your paint palette, you know? This is your, your living nursery to create, create, create off of the edges. <clears throat> so you have, this is your, uh, also like your, your laboratory, your learning center. So you're bringing plants in, you're putting them into the system and you're seeing how they react before they get to, before they get to graduate into the forest. They kind of go into the classroom, you know? So um, I feel that's one of the biggest things that I'm doing now in my garden is my garden's always growing off of the edges and we're using a lot of tarps and plywood and big sheets of metal, whatever I can get my hands on that can smother out the grasses. Here in Hawaii, people think just because we have so much sun and we have so much water and the soil's relatively fertile that it's really easy to garden here, but it's nothing, it's complete opposite. Yes, everything can grow really well, but we also have all the weeds from all around the world. And since our ecosystem was completely isolated from the rest of the world, the niches for those weeds are open. So they fill those niches in really fast when you don't do it. Um, and we have this, this grass called guinea grass, which is extremely strong. And they use it in the centropic farming systems and methodology. Um, but a lot of those guys, those guys' uh, systems aren't nearly as wet as ours is. So since we have so much water, these grasses are extremely pushy. And they make clumps that are like, I don't know, the size of by three, four feet in diameter and um, really extremely strong. So by covering up those grasses with the tarps and with um, these sheets of metal, I can eliminate them and then move into them by applying heavy mulch or applying cardboard or whatever I can get my hands on. Um, one of the things that I'm learning right now that I think is something that I'm being taught from my garden that I am uh, actually implementing more into my food forest style is the heavy uses of grasses. And I'm, I'm also learning that from the Syntropic farming uh, styles. They're using a lot of banana mulch. Um, but what I'm actually seeing here is 
the grass clippings is one of our biggest allies. If we can collect up huge amounts of grass clippings and put them as thick as you can collect and let them compost down, um, and then also adding a top layer of something that's going to protect them, something thicker, because the top layer is going to oxidize from the sun and the oxygen. So what I usually use would be like palm fronds or vetiver grass or something that's really thick and not going to uh, just evaporate like grass would, because there's like a sacrificial layer on top. But if some, if you're able to create, to collect that kind of, um, biomass it's going to create soil extremely fast so the soil wants to wants to mature but it needs to mature through succession and the start of the succession is grass and the succession is going to work its way into wood so feed it the grass and then add the wood to it on top so it could it could be ready to the, the grass will hold the moisture and then the wood will give it the fungus that it needs to be able to have the teeth to turn into a forest. Um, let's see. So one of the things that people think about when they're thinking about agroforestry systems and food forestry system is a lot about the support species, you know, the nitrogen fixers and uh, all the trees that we use to feed to the other trees because we're doing that a lot. We're trying to create an ecosystem and fast forward. And what I've learned is you really got to know the plants that you're working with when you're doing this because a lot of these support species trees they grow ridiculously fast and they have the ability to create a lot of shade which is a really good thing because the more shade that they could create will deter the weeds and the pressure keep the ground cool and and actually store all that um, energy that is coming from the sun and all the elements that are passing through your system, but it's also going to create you a lot of work. So if you don't manage those support species trees correctly and you don't cut them at the right times, they will overtake your system and then they will shade out your, your fruit trees and they will deter their growth or misshape them. Or if you're not on it, they will completely take over and kill them. Um, one of the trees I was just mentioning, Suspania sesbind, was one of the main trees that we used. And I don't think we really understood how strong that thing was. And it grows so ridiculously fast. Um, it just constantly needs to be, to be trimmed and maintained. And what you're going to learn is there's going to be different trees that are going to be good for different job applications. There's going to be ones that are going to create good shade. And then there's going to be ones that are going to create good leaf litter. There's going to be ones that are going to make good duff, like humus duff. And then, you know, some of them will be tall, short, and skinny and rebound fast. So you're going to have to learn your nitrogen fixers because one of them doesn't fill all the niches. And they're all going to have different properties. What you're looking for is you're looking for plants that have big leaves that are thick that when they when you do put the leaf litter on the ground they don't disappear fast they're going to be there for a long time because if they disappear really fast you're not going to be able to cover as much ground with those leaves now if you do have the really small leaf um, nitrogen fixing support species what you want to do is make sure when you do use that as a chop and drop you're putting that on the ground layer and you're covering it with the other plants that are gonna have bigger leaves for the same reason, so they don't off gas and disappear really fast. They also have the ability to turn it into soil faster with those tiny leaves because of more surface area. Um, but you just gotta be aware and you gotta start looking at the different leaves of the different support species trees and starting to understand what they, where do they fit in. Um, then there's also the, the workability of the trees. Certain nitrogen fixers are really easy to break by hand, like Glaricidia. And then there's certain ones, I feel like pigeon pea, that yeah, you can break it by hand, but you're kind of fucking it up the whole time. You want to use your tools, you want to use your saws, because if you hurt the tree, it's going to not, it's not going to be around as long. It's going to decompose faster than you want it to, instead of it being around as long as it can be around. Um, so 
really interact with them. Don't be scared to cut them. Understand what happens when you take all the leaves off, which, what happens when you take all the branches off. Understand what happens when you completely coppice it and you let it regrow. Understand how to kill it and push it to those boundaries of death because if you don't know how to get rid of it, then you don't know how to work with it. Um, I also feel that with uh, Inga ice cream bean, it is one of my favorite trees to use for a chop and drop, but it's also a huge tree. And if you put it too close to your fruit trees and you don't manage it, it's gonna outgrow it and, and it's gonna outcompete it. It also throws runners from the root systems. So if even if you do take down the main part, it can start throwing up other ones around the ed edges. And if you're not mowing and you're not paying attention, you could create yourself a huge workload. So what I'm getting at is nitrogen fixers create great soil. They create mulch on demand, but they create a lot of workload. And if you don't have the foresight to take care of that workload, if you don't have the, the back to do it, then you're going to kind of get yourself in trouble. So what one of my um, things that I'm starting to do more of now is I'm starting to really work more with lower support species. Um, and my support species that I'm working with, like I was saying in the beginning, first starting from the ground, I feel like a lot of the agroforestry starts from the trees, but that's really not where our attention should be. Our attention should start with the ground and make sure that our ground layer is completely sufficient and is covered. Um, that's why I'm, I'm using a lot of uh, sisu, sisu spinach, Brazilian spinach. And then the other ones I use extensively right now are comfrey. I know I was talking to you about comfrey when I was out there. And then um, African bush basil. And these three really create a nice thick low layer. Because like I was saying, you want to make sure that the ground is not having any kind of penetration of light. And if you can manage this light barrier below your knees, then it's a lot easier to manage by stepping on it than it is from cutting down trees with chainsaws. You know what I mean? Um, and then also, as far as mineral cycling, I would say that I've learned that there has not been a plant that has created more fertility for me than comfrey. I feel like this is the plant that is like composting system that I don't have to manage. And not only is it making compost for me in the soil, it's also making life and it's providing um, barriers for all the weeds and keeping the sun, the sun is the, keeping the ground protected from the sun. And it's also extremely valuable medicine. And every time now that I see that I want to create something, I'm creating my food forest now from, from um, embryos of comfrey. Like instead of starting from a field, I'm starting from comfrey, a patch of comfrey. And then from there, I have complete control over that ground. And I can pull those comfries out as I wish and garden inside of them. And then all everything that I pull out, I propagate out to the edges again. And that lets me take back the space. It starts the fertilization cycles. And really another thing that I've, I've noticed is when we think about chop and drop, it's way too easy of a term for how complicated of a thing it is. If you, in the beginning, when I was starting this, I was like, I really want this to be as natural as possible. I wanna just cut stuff and leave it there. And cause that's how, the, that's how it happens in the forest, you know? But what it really comes down to is, is maneuverability and maintenance. If you can't move in your system well, then you're going to be tripping on things. You're going to be, you know, hurting yourself, kicking things. Um, things aren't going to be able to get mowed. It creates problems. So whenever you do bring down mulch and whenever you do cut trees, you got to be able to organize all that biomass in your system so that you're not stumbling upon it and you're not creating yourself a big weedy mess. Because what we're seeing is like, if you lay down all these pieces of wood, and if you don't cover that as best as you can with shade, then you're gonna have grasses in there, you're gonna have vines in there, you're gonna have all kinds of stuff in there 
that guess what's going to have to happen next month you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to take care of all that again or it's just going to turn into a shit show so what i do now is when i plant these systems i'm planting solid blocks of comfrey and whenever i put down my wood mulch i put down my wood mulch in between my comfrey plants because then guess what happens they just get covered by the comfrey leaves and then the all the wood gets to get taken care of by the microbes and the fungi and i'm not tripping on it i know exactly where it's supposed to go and if i really would have understood that in the beginning I, we would have covered all of our berms and swells and comfrey and we would have had distinguished places to put all of our wood mulch and it would have really kept the forest a lot cleaner we would have saved ourselves thousands of hours of rearranging wood and it just makes more sense but these are the things that you do after you make the forest and have to disassemble it and remake it over and over and over and over um but that's why i'm sharing with you guys because i want you guys to do it better than we've done it at this point um so one thing that i'm also seeing right now is whenever we get started on this we're like oh man i got this seed from from this fruit and i'm gonna put it in the in my my nursery and i'm gonna grow out these trees and i'm gonna plant it by all means everybody we, that's what we're going to do and we got to experiment but really it's about having the best quality genetics because every time that you plant a tree you're investing a lot of time and a lot of your years in that tree now looking back i wish we would have made sure that every single one of those trees would have been grafted trees that we knew the genetics were going to be superb because there's so many times now that either those trees aren't fruiting yet at all because they were seedlings or when they do fruit, they're semi-par or super sparse because they're just seedlings. So learn to graft now. I'm gonna say that again, learn to graft now while you're just getting started and cause you're gonna have a lot of learning curve in that in its own right. So there is amazing, you just totally clips me. <laughs> so there's amazing genetics out there and it's really worth doing the research to learn those genetics because there is a complete range of, of quality in the fruit. And if you can get the quality fruit, you're gonna save yourself so much time. Okay, I'm getting notes from my love over here, hold on. Yes, and then also male and female, if you are just putting in seeds of say something like chocolate sapote, they need male and female. So when you do plant your plants, plant in and groupings of at least three, okay? So you have good cross pollination and that you have enough um, genetics there to be able to get both male and female. Um, another thing that I really am, is I'm starting to do now more that I really wish I would have understood in the beginning was when i was excited about those seeds instead of taking them to the nursery and growing them out there and then putting them in the forest create my ecosystem with my comfrey my sisu and everything mark my spaces direct seed my trees over direct seed my trees let them come up so they have they have tap roots that are tapped into the ground because that's what millennia of nature's design has taught, has, you know, evolved trees to do is to have a proper tap root and then learn how to graft onto the top. Because if you could learn how to top work with direct seeded roots, you're going to have so much more, so much more strength in a tree because like that's by us putting the, those plants in pots, some of them do okay, some of them do so-so, but it's kind of like Forrest Gump's legs. Yeah, you know, you can be okay, but it's, it's not how it's supposed to be, you know? So direct seed, direct seed top, top work. Learn your grafting now so you can do that when these trees come up. Overseed, so whenever you're doing this top working, you get a few chances at it seeds are cheap avocado seeds you could come across them all over the place start learning how to do that because 
the, the skill is just so valuable. There's not a reason not to learn how to do it. Um, and then another thing that I'm experimenting, experimenting with right now is while I direct seed these to actually graft them together. Um, right now in the garden, I, my buddy Ollie, Oliver Cohen, who I'm farming with, and he's like a plant legend in the making right now, he grafted together all three of these rootstocks of avocado. And in about six months, I had an avocado leaf that was about this big. It looked like a cacao leaf and the plant was only about waist high. That, after seeing that, I was like, whoa, why aren't we doing that in the field? So what I see is if we could direct seed, graft together those direct seeds and then top work them, I guarantee you we can get fruit at least the third the time faster because we have so much more vigor in those root systems. So pots are cool, but pots are in the nurseries are to move around the genetics. Really the seeds are supposed to go in the ground and then we can bring the genetics to the fields. If you have the ecosystem correct, then you could do the work in the fields and not have them completely get toasted by the sun. Also follow the cycles, follow the, the, um, the seasons. Right now we just got into our rainy season. For me, this is comfrey season. This isn't even, this isn't wet season. Like right now is the time for me to plant comfrey and to plant my sisu and my bush basils. And that's what we've been doing out in the farm. Like we've been taking cuttings, taking cuttings and building off of our guilds. Um, we have a little bit of like a, a hybrid orchard style here that we're doing on this farm. And we, we planted our trees with tractors. We planted a whole bunch of really exotic stuff and we gave them really good mulch beds. And now we, we we're gilding with the sisu and then the bush basils and I'm growing, um, you know, eggplant and roselle and chilies all inside of these, these beds. Um, we're putting, uh, plywood on the edges of it to kill off all the grass and then we're moving that plywood around to to make these nice lines right and then from there we're, we're putting in the bush basils as we kill the grasses and then they're going to fill in but now is the time when your wet season comes that's your time to plant your direct seeds that's your time to keep on moving around your cuttings um instead of fighting it in the wind and fi fighting it in the summertime or fighting it in your dry time all right, let's see what else I have in here. Yes, so experiment, man. Like, this is all a big experiment. I feel I'm so lucky now to have a garden and to have a food forest that is my laboratory. And I feel I try, when I go into it now, I go into it with complete openness and just to listen to what I'm supposed to do and to learn from what it is telling me and what it's doing and what it is not doing. So I think you should always experiment with new plants that got you excited and that are coming from different parts of the world that like other people, you know, what has the hype, what tastes delicious, what do you want to grow, but also like grow the old faithful stuff. Don't not, don't leave out the stuff that works just because you wanted to try all kinds of new things, you know? Um, I felt like that here. We, I was just talking to Ollie about this yesterday. He planted out huge amounts of durians and then the durians didn't do it because it was too windy. And then he planted a whole bunch of mangoes and the mangoes didn't do it because it was too wet. But he should have planted avocados because avocados are just crushing it, you know what I mean? And that's what we're doing now. We're planting avocados with the assortment of a whole bunch of other things that are really doing it here that have surfaced from our experiments. So go and create your diversity, but don't go so diverse that you don't find your niche and you, and the niche has to work for your ecosystem. It can't just work because you want it to, you can't, you can't change the ecosystem as easily as you can to adapt to it. So, you know, create relationships with the people around you that are doing this kind of work in your region, but also on the same latitude from around the world. Learn from those people. Go visit those people. It's worth your weight in gold to go to those trips to, to, to not only like 
just completely plant nerd out with them and create that relationship, but to try their fruit and to see their styles and to learn from their mistakes and their failures and their successes. And what is, the, what are they excited about? You know what I mean? What, what are they trying to do? Because learning from each other, you're going to learn so much faster as a group than you are from just you doing it by yourself. And really I've been blessed to be able to work in this food forest because it's a community food forest. And whenever I say that, it's, it's a very unique thing that it's kind of like a community garden, but instead of everybody taking care of their individual plots, we've been taking care of this plot together for eight years. So we've been having a reoccurrence of, you know, the same stewards coming together for eight years. We've been out on a fishing trip now for eight years, teaching ourselves how to fish. And the world is hungry, man. And they're, we need to learn how to fish. So the best thing to do is to be with other people fishing. It's way better than being out by yourself. So build those relationships, get other people that you think that might be interested in this stuff and bring them in. If you can inoculate one person with the plant bug that is like, you see this seed? There's this potential in this seed to create a whole forest and to feed people for thousands of years. If you can get that seed inside of somebody's head that has the fertile fields, then you can start creating allies that aren't even there yet. So like there needs to be those people that are going to pioneer that. And I feel that's what Paul Massey did with our project. He was, he was the one that made that song and, 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 and started doing it by just, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not even asking anybody else to do it. I'm going to do it. And the people showed up because he's doing the work. And then from, <clears throat> from there, I was able to, get on his song and be like this guy's doing it like why are we not doing this and then slowly we built up to a crew of people doing it and that's really what i want to see happen like our project is is not only food for us but it's a dirt church and it's a dirt church because we get to put our hands in the earth and connect back into what we're supposed to be doing and that's stewarding the ground and when people come to our project they see it they're like, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And it's not that way because it's a farm. And it's not that way because that's what we were trying to do. It's because we were trying to give the soil back what it wanted. And it, wanted a com it wants to be a complete ecosystem. And when you do that with human intent and design <clears throat> and aesthetic beauty, that's something that you actually want to be in, it creates something quite beautiful. But it has to be done with the intention of building soil and creating an ecosystem. And if you look at it as individual parts, you're going to miss the whole story. The story is it is an ecosystem, and that's what you're trying to replicate. Everything else is just bits and pieces that you're trying to learn to be able to create that ecosystem. Um, uh, Rob, that's so that I'm beautiful. Like I'm from my at a faster rate. Please, please go on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, I feel like right now I've I've taken the food forest and I've brought it home, and I'm creating like a mini my my garden is like a mini food forest because I have all the elements of our food forest as far as of all the plants. And then I'm also working with a lot more annuals because it's my zone one. The food forest is down the street. Um, and I'm learning now about the value of the vertical space. And I know they talk about that in permaculture, but I really haven't utilized it to the fullest extent until I did here. And what I'm kind of developing now is as I make my systems, I'm going to start with my comfrey. Now, in the middle of these comfrey banks, how I would do it now is I would make teepees of bamboo and grow all my beans and my vines on there. My, my, my long beans, my wing beans, chayote and, uh, and long lufa. And those four plants right there will give me a huge amount of food. They will make me a huge amount of shade. They're gonna make me a huge amount of biomass. 
and they're also going to outgrow almost any of the support species trees that I have. And those support species trees, they're not going to give me food like that can give me food. Now, what I would do is I would plant my fruit trees on the edges of we're in suspense for his next word, but he has fallen off. So we're gonna give him a second to rejoin. All right, Rob, welcome back. Back. <laughs> cool. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you, sorry about that. You know the internet. Anybody yeah. else have questions? So we were just asking a few questions. One is um, about grafting. Can you graft male and female on the same yes. fruit? Yeah, we should have, yes, yeah, yes, really? absolutely. Yeah, that's the important part about collecting the genes. You know, you're gonna find certain trees need both male and female, and you can definitely put those on the same tree. You just have to make sure you get the right, the right scions. Beautiful, beautiful. That definitely answers that question. And then another question we had was, uh, what is your favorite way to start that island ecosystem you were talking about? What's the uh, effective methods you've found that creates strong islands? I mean, from what I'm doing, I, I tarp it out. So I'll lay down a tarp and give it a few months and completely cook out the grasses. And then from there, I mean, if you wanna be as, as like weed proof as possible, cardboard it and then plant your comfries as close as you can. If you do that, you're gonna be tight. So comfrey, cardboard, sweet potato, sisu, give it all the ground covers, you know? And then at the same time, plant your bananas. Bananas are so important for us as far as for soil building and for, and for holding moisture and everything like that. So, and your pigeon pea, your plants that are gonna be your support species trees, but really focus in on the ground layers. And then from there, you could, you know, get in there and, and you know, do your direct seeding and work off the edges. And so direct seed hard, but also don't be scared to cull every, cull the trees out if they're way too tight in time, you know? 25 foot spacing is kind of, is, a, you know, a good, you know, shot. Um, so yeah, don't be scared to, to cut trees out as long as you're planting trees, you know? Beautiful, beautiful. Now you had talked about chop and drop and maintenance with those. What are um, some easy to maintain chop and drops you're using in the food forest? Um, well, easy to maintain is a really tricky one because I mean, all of it is work realistically, you know? Um, no. Sorry, someone's calling me. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, relatively easy would be the pigeon pea. I would think that's the most, the easiest plant to chop and drop. Honestly, right now, what I'm starting to play with is cassava. I'm starting to plant cassava everywhere and I don't need it everywhere. But what I'm figuring is, is if I'm cutting it and I'm just using it as a chop and drop, it's doing good things under the ground. You know what I mean? If those things rot under the ground, then that's, that's good for everybody because if you've ever dug up a piece of cassava that was rotted in the ground, it's, it's doing good work and it's breaking up compacted soil. So I would say the two easiest ones would probably be pigeon pea and cassava. And I mean, comfrey, like instead of chop and drop, I rather step on things, man. I rather step on it. It's so much less work than bending over. My back is already starting to get to me, you know? <laughs> so. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been using the cassava as a su summer cover crop. And it go. works fantastic to keep the grasses and everything out from underneath yeah. it. And here in Florida, it's just perfect. So it's uh, that's really exciting. Yeah, I've seen you guys pull cassava up like, <laughs> yoink, right out of the yeah. ground. That was, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we have hundreds and hundreds of pounds in the ground. So it's, it's, oh, it's a great yeah. uh, uh, resiliency crop. Yes. Uh, what about grasses? Um, you had mentioned vetiver. Um, what are your favorite grasses to use? Realistically, grasses are challenged here. I don't use a lot of grasses. And even the vetiver that I do use, I'm so lucky to have it almost like hand delivered from a project next door that we planted. Because um, vetiver gets gigantic, you know? And it's actually kind of hard to maintenance in itself for us because there will be weeds that will grow in the vetiver and then you gotta be weeding a vetiver. Um, 
but as far as chop and drop material, I think there's almost nothing better than vetiver to like walk on and make like paths and as like a finishing mulch. Oh man, vetiver is like the Gucci of chop and drop. Mm -hmm. um, but grasses, I can't say I've been really playing with a lot. I really need to learn my grasses that I want um, because we, sadly we spend a lot of the time getting rid of the grasses here because they're runner, they're runner grasses or they're clumping grasses and um, neither one of those I really want in our system. So I need to learn my lower ground, my lower grasses. And if you guys have any for me to, to, to learn, please, by all means, I need to learn that myself. My favorite that I'm using right now is a sterile napier grass and it grows okay. up to about eight feet tall and makes these beautiful heads on them that are, it's just a beautiful grass and it doesn't spread but it makes uh -huh. a wonderful uh, chop and drop. And so you okay. really make a great edge with it. And it's a real thick, almost like the cane grass that you're growing out there, except it doesn't have the seeds. Okay. So it's, okay. uh, yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful grass. It's kind of like a sorghum sedan kind of situation. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah, we've played with that one as a, as a cover crop. I'm growing sorghum right now. Um, I think it's broom sorghum in my garden, just experimenting with. And that's a really beautiful plant. Um, but it's just kind of like thin as far as like a chop and drop, like it's just not a lot, a lot, but we have so many, we have so much Guinea grass around here. There's always, there's always some, if you want to look for it. Yes. Um, but I want to, I want to learn the ground cover grasses better, you know, Absolutely. I understand like the, the ground wants to be covered with grass. That's one of the first things that come. I just got to make myself better, um, you know, have better relations with it really. So yeah, you can only pull grasses for so many hours before you start getting a little upset at them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Work, working with nature. Exactly. You had spoke about the niches that each of these plants take and really understanding the niches. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that the more I learn in these food forests, the more I see that it also relates to the people that I'm working with working the food for us and in those community gardens each one of those people have those niches and maybe one person is really good at working with the grasses maybe one person loves trimming the trees and it's 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 really exciting to see those relationships not only with the plants but with the people in the plants and the same ecosystems evolve yep yep i completely agree in our system um paul massey i would say is the tree guy he's he has his he has his hard hat on He's up there with chainsaws. He's bringing down the biomassy. That's why we call him the poly biomassy. And that's, that's what he does. And then we have other guys, my friend James, who was kind of a, a new steward. He, what, what I call the champion of, so he's the champion of Sisu. So like whenever it's time, he's the one pulling the Sisu. He's the one planting the Sisu because he knows that if Paul's cutting the trees, then he's letting the light in. And if the light's coming in and it's hitting the ground and there's not sisu there, who's going to be weeding it? James is going to be weeding it. So he better get that sisu in there before the weeds come. So everybody starts to see, like, I consider myself the champion of country because that's the plant relation that I've created at this point. And, like, actually orchestrating the guilds. Like, who needs to come in here, you know? Like, that's kind of my role. Um, but everybody kind of finds their plants that they, they champion. My love, Andy, she, she's been bringing in a lot of the different natives in. And uh, we have, you know, we have people that are just about the bananas or about the cocos, you know. So, yeah, it's interesting. Like, people will find those plants that they're drawn to or they'll be told by the forest, this is what you need to do so you don't have to do X, Y, and Z later. And that's really the big thing is learning how to not make yourself more work because it's already enough work as it is. Yes, those relationships totally prevail themselves. So it's so wonderful to, to be part of that, that beautiful combination. I, I could sit and talk to you forever, Rob. You have such a passion that comes through in your conversations. And I love the project and I've been out to the Kauai Food Forest and it is an inspiration. So I highly recommend it. Is, uh, can you tell people where to find your work or how to get more information about the food forest? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say the last thing, you know, do this with people you love, guys, because you're going to need to love to do it. And it's, oh, it's going to be amplified when you do it with people you love. Um, you can find me at Rob underscore Cruz on the Instagrams. 
Uh, could, and then uh, our website, kawaiifoodforest.org. Um, the nonprofit is Regenerations. If anybody is interested in helping us, actually right now, um, our project is a seven acre parcel, a part of a 300 acre piece of land that the whole thing is for sale right now in Kauai. So if you know anybody that has buku money and is interested in regenerative agriculture, we need to be able to get this land um, preserved because I think it's one of the best examples of regenerative agriculture in the islands. And I think people are, are really um, valuing health and understanding the, the value of, of food ecosystems more now than they ever have. Uh, so it needs to be preserved. So yeah, we're in Kilauea on the island of Kauai and uh, we have volunteer days on Saturdays and we're trying to create stewards. At this point, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, um, I'm getting tired of teaching people that just come and go in our system. I need to teach people that come and stay um, and that are there to be able to take care of the forest or to be able to create other food forest systems that stay in our, our circuit and to have that energy um, bloom inside of its, of its own Petri dish. So um, please, you know, hit us up, look us up and uh, don't be a stranger. And yeah, let's grow together. Mm. Thank you for being a steward of the, of the earth and for teaching so many and inspiring so many to be stewards as well. Your work is, uh, you, uh, you're one of my inspirations. So thank you for, for holding that in your heart and sharing it with so many people. It's really yeah. wonderful to see your passion. Yeah. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, if, uh, if you got anything uh, from the class, feel free to donate to our, uh, in our, our funds. It keeps the, the class, the, the line open. And uh, there'll be a link uh, right below that you can click and give from your heart. Uh, we want to thank Amy Zelt for doing all our production work. Thank you so much for keeping the lines working. Uh, and we'll be joining everybody in the Instagram or in the Facebook group, community group, where we'll be answering more questions. We got some of the questions from the groups that we're going to put on. Thank you, Rob, for being so amazingly beautiful. Uh, next week uh, is Thanksgiving, so we're not going to have a class. So everybody, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and are around people you love, either on Zoom or <laughs> around a table. Um, and the week after that, we'll have Joe Pierce talking about uh, bananas more than just food. Um, he's a wonderful banana expert that had to reschedule, so it's good to have him back. Nature tends to compete in immature systems. And you can see this in, when you're starting out a food forest, all these, everything's competing for the space that we've opened up. And I like to, to learn from these lessons, like hum humanity has been in a comp competitive mode for so long. So eventually, if you get into a, a mature foods forest, you'll see the collaborations. Mm -hmm. Everything will start cooperating. And one system, like the island system Rob was speaking about, will feed another system. And I like to see that as a way of humanity to shift into a time of cooperation and love. And hopefully the food forests are sharing that knowledge with us. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll walk into this beautiful regenerative world together. And mm -hmm. we'll all get to know our places within that food forest. Yes. Thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Hope to see you soon in a couple of weeks and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. Aloha, to the brother. Old world culture. Much love, brother. Aloha. Aloha.